Welcome students. This is our lab activity called experiment number three, chemical analysis of a mixture. In your introductory course or perhaps in other chemistry classes, you've learned some separation techniques, way of separating components in a mixture. For example, in experiment two, we use filtration, which is used to separate solids from liquids out of a heterogeneous mixture. You might remember the technique of evaporation. You separate non-volatile from volatile components of a solution. Typically, you evaporate the solvent and you leave behind the solutes now in solid form. Other techniques you might learn in future courses are, for example, centrifugation. It's similar to filtration and separating solids from liquids, but in this case, you compact the solids into a pellet and you remove or decant the solvent, the liquid. And there's also the technique of dialysis, which is where you pass components through a membrane and separate them that way. And there are other techniques that you can use. Now, what if the components of the mixture are very similar? For example, what we're going to be analyzing is a mixture of calcium oxide and calcium carbonate. Both of these are white crystalline solids with similar physical properties. So where, for example, you could look at a mixture of salt and pepper, and although it would be very hard to do, you could still go in with a pair of very small pliers and separate out the grains of salt from the grains of pepper because they're very different. But in this case, the two components of this mixture are very similar. You cannot separate them through physical methods. So we're going to have to resort to a chemical method. So the objective of our activity is to find the percent composition of a calcium oxide calcium carbonate mixture. And the formula for percent composition of a mixture is very similar to the percent composition of a compound. It's essentially the grams of component that we're looking for divided by the grams of sample times 100%. So our main goal will be what is the percent of calcium oxide? This is the chemical reaction we're going to use. We're going to react the components of our mixture with H2SO4, that is sulfuric acid, Notice that both of them produce a solid, calcium sulfate. Both of them produce water, but calcium carbonate uh, also produces carbon dioxide gas. Remember, we're reacting a mixture here. So there are problems you could encounter. For example, one of them is, as the calcium sulfate begins to form, it is insoluble. And what could happen is that it might form a layer that blocks the reactants from reacting with the acid. So how do we solve this? Well, one thing we're going to do is we're going to use concentrated sulfuric acid. That means we're going to hit this mixture with a lot of sulfuric acid to make sure that it sort of like overcomes any blockage that we get from the calcium sulfate product. The other thing we're going to do is we're, go, we're going to apply heat. This is going to help us, first of all, vaporize the water and also push the reaction forward. So that means that if we react the mixture with sulfuric acid, the sulfuric acid and all of the other products were going to be vaporized. They're going to be removed so that all we will have is our calcium sulfate product. To do the reaction, we're going to be using some pieces of equipment that you may or may not be familiar with. One of them is the Bunsen burner. This is one of the preferred methods of delivering heat in the uh, lab. The uh, Bunsen burner has several parts. We call this part here the barrel. We call the little uh, collar here that screws on the base, the air valve, and it has little windows, so it allows to control the uh, amount of air coming in and therefore adjust the intensity of the flame. Again, this is called the air valve. In some Bunsen burners, perhaps not the ones that we have in the lab, there's an additional control at the bottom of the base called the gas or the needle valve. And this one controls how much gas goes into the Bunsen burner and therefore uh, we use it to adjust the height of the flame. One of the important things when using a Bunsen burner is getting the right kind of flame. And we have here four examples. Over on the left, we have a generally yellow smoky flame Kind of the ones you see in, I don't know, fireplaces or uh, fire pits and stuff like that. 
See, but from our perspective, that is what I call a lame flame. That is not what we want. What we need is we need a flame that's blue to make the flame go from yellow and smoky to blue we need to open the air valve that yellow flame indicates that there's not enough air not enough oxygen coming in for the combustion reaction notice also that in a well uh, formed flame you have a sky blue inner cone and then you have an outer you know blue violet cone the hottest part of the flame is essentially the ring around the tip of that inner sky blue cone. This is the hottest part of the flame. Sometimes the instructions for a procedure will say for you to use a soft flame or a low flame or a cool flame. All these expressions represent that you want the object to be heated, to be in contact with that outer cone of the flame, because that is the cooler part of the flame. Whenever they tell you to use high heat or intense heat or something like that, what that means is that you want for the object to be heated, to be in contact with that hottest part of the flame, the tip of the uh, sky blue inner cone. Our reaction is going to be carried in a crucible. This is a container made of ceramic that resists very high heat. Uh, because, number one, it is going to be very hot. And secondly, because you don't want to uh, get your skin oils or any other contaminants onto the surface of that crucible, what we're going to do is we're going to handle it with these crucible tongs. And later in the procedures video, I will show you how to use the crucible tongs. By the way, in today's experiment, we're not going to be using a lid on the crucible. Some reminders about working with the crucible and the Bunsen burner. Number one, if the Bunsen burner flame goes out, before you try to relight it, turn off the main gas valve before trying to reignite the burner uh, flame. Whenever you have to move the Bunsen, Bunsen burner, always uh, handle it by the base. Don't touch the barrel. Even after you turn it off, it's still going to be hot for a while. Always handle the high crucible with your tongs, not with your hands. And make sure when you're carrying it that you have a folded paper towel, I mean, sorry, a folded paper towel on your other hand, uh, a few inches underneath the crucible. So if it falls, if it spills, if it uh, slips, and it falls, you can catch it uh, before it hits the floor and breaks into pieces. <clears throat> We've already seen the video and practiced using the analytical balance, but just a few reminders. Remember that whenever you're taking a measurement, you want to keep the sliding windows closed so that you don't get any drafts, any air currents affecting your reading. Never place chemicals directly on the plate. Always put them on a container or paper or something to hold them. Always wait for the crucible to cool down before you wait it. If you put the crucible in and it's too hot, what's going to happen is going to create uh, a draft of air. It's called convection, you know, exchange of warm versus cooler air. And that's going to make your display uh, drift a lot. And very important, clean spills immediately. Don't wait till later. Don't say to yourself, oh, I got to come back and clean it. Uh, no, because other students might be wanting to use the balance. Or also, you could uh, allow some corrosion to happen if you spill chemicals on the metal plate. Always use the same balance. So once you decide I'm going to use balance, let's say, number one, I have to use the same balance for all the measurements done during each experiment, during each trial of that experiment. The reason is the balance has been calibrated, but it's been calibrated at the position that it is on the bench. And so taking that into account, if you switch balances, you risk uh, using a balance that is off by you know, maybe a milligram or so. And in these kinds of experiments, a milligram or so is quite a difference. Our crucible is going to be held in this form here. The crucible with its contents is going to be held in a clay triangle 
which is going to be supported on an iron ring on a ring stand and that's how you will uh, hold it or let it sit while you apply the heat to it okay make a few seconds to watch that so imprint an image of what it's going to look like okay as we said we're going to be using sulfuric acid first we're going to use dilute sulfuric acid to basically suspend our mixture which is going to be a solid kind of spread it out uh, kind of turn it into smaller suspended particles but then we're going to be adding concentrated sulfuric acid we need to add sulfuric acid, concentrated sulfuric acid, very slowly. Remember our safety guides, AA, add acid. So we're going to add the concentrated acid to a solution that has dilute sulfuric acid in it. But because it's more dilute, uh, we're going to add the concentrated one to it very slowly. Typically, the sulfuric acid uh, and other reagents are held in bottles that have a coin top stopper. We don't want the stopper, you know, the lid, to touch uh, the surface of the tray or bench to avoid contamination. So what you do is you hold it between your fingers while you access the reagent. If you don't feel confident of that, basically you come in with your teammate, your lab partner, and have them hold the stopper, the lid, while you dispense the reagent. If you spill acid on your skin, you need to wash it immediately. Don't wait a few seconds. Don't say to yourself, oh, I'm going to wash it after I finish this. No, everything you're doing, stop it immediately. Go to the sink and wash the spill of acid on your skin for a couple of minutes at the very least. Another thing is if you spill the concentrated acid on the bench, actually the dilute acid also, uh, you can't simply wipe it off. You need to first neutralize it with baking soda before then you rinse it and then you wipe it. So if you spill acid on the bench, please let your instructor know so that we can come in and do the cleanup. One of the techniques we're gonna use is something called heating to constant mass. This is a, essentially a strategy that is used to ensure that the reaction has proceeded to completion. The way we apply it is we take two consecutive mass measurements and they have to be within a minimum difference of each other. So in our case, we're gonna do the chemical reaction. We're gonna obtain calcium sulfate product and we're gonna wait it. Then we're gonna add acid again and repeat the reaction. And we're gonna wait it after the second round of reaction. And this is for each trial. We're gonna have two trials for each experiment. The difference in mass between the two rounds of reaction has to be less than five milligrams. If the difference between two consecutive measurements is more than that, that means that you probably did not get a full reaction the first time around. You'll have to repeat one more round of reaction. And generally, because of time constraints, we will tell you that's uh, as much as you can do. So if after the third run, the third round of reaction, you are not within five milligrams, you're going to stop it there. Just work with the numbers you have. Don't worry. It should all work out. Okay. What we're going to do now is I'm going to have you go. And after you have read the procedures and converted them into an outline form, please watch the next video in this sequence so I can walk you through the procedures of the experiment. Thank you so much.